Hello everyone, I am back with another video. Today I'm formally putting together and ranking my top 25 PlayStation 4 games. Now to this point, you might have already seen my two videos that I've already released, talking about 25 to 11 and 10 to 1 for my top 25 PlayStation 4 games, but I thought it might be fun to release a separate video that I'm recording before I recorded those, really showcasing and capturing how I formally got to that list of top 25 games, because it's no easy feat to rank a list of 25 games for any console, let alone one that I have a tremendous fondness for in the PlayStation 4. Nearly every genre, incredibly well represented. I got it a few years after launch, so I already had a, a nice big old plate of exclusives and third-party stuff to, to catch up on. And over the course of its life, we've just had a tremendous number of incredible exclusive games. And it was also the generation where I tended to play most of my first party stuff. So over the course of this video, I will kind of show you the guardrails that I have for myself in terms of games that are contenders, games that are kind of out of the realm of possibility, and also kind of giving you some insight into the games that I maybe haven't played yet on the PlayStation 4 as well. And then we'll be going through the brutal exercise of whittling down a pretty big list of games down to 25. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, let's go ahead and get things started. So first up, we're just going to take a look at my backloggery page because before we can get into the list building, I think it's important to first establish what are the guardrails here? What are games that are contenders or eligible for this list? What are the games that you have to draw a line in the sand somewhere with this process and, and building a, a list of top 25 games? So let's quickly touch on what those guardrails are. Uh, this is my backloggery page. This is where I catalog manually uh, the entirety of my game collection. I have a video series that I started about a year and a half ago going through each of my individual consoles as I update these um, as I update this page in real time. So for each of those consoles, you can you can check that out. I'll post a, a link in the description as well. But as you can see down here, PlayStation 4, about 135 games. This isn't completely accurate. I've, I've purchased games again in the past couple of months that I, I haven't updated this list yet. Uh, but just giving you a general sense of the number of games I have, the number of games I've beaten, whenever I flag something as completed, means I've gotten the Platinum Trophy, or 100% of the game, uh, to the best of my abilities. So as we click in PlayStation 4 here, we'll kind of establish the, the guardrails here. So the first one is no remasters for games that I've played in a prior generation. So an example of that would be the Nathan Drake Collection. I played the Uncharted Trilogy on the PlayStation 3. Uncharted 4, of course, or Lost Legacy would be eligible because it came out on the PlayStation 4, and that's when I first played it. Um, the Ezio Assassin's Creed trilogy, that's not going to be eligible. Even stuff like Spyro the Reignited trilogy and Crash Bandicoot the Insane trilogy, uh, those are virtually the same games with a very beautiful graphical upgrade, uh, but they're virtually the same game as the original. Those types of things would not be eligible. Uh, the second category I would say is anything that has come out on both the PlayStation 4 and 5. So your Horizon Forbidden West, God of War Ragnarok, Marvel's Mile, uh, Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales, those types of games also not going to be represented in this top 25, won't be eligible. I want to save those for a eventual top 25 for my PlayStation 5 stuff. And then the third, as I consult my notes, just I guess obviously any games that I have yet to play to this point. So just scrolling through here a little bit, I think some not notable ones would be Control, Days Gone, Death Stranding. Um, I haven't played any of the Yakuza games or Yakuza games. Um, Hellblade, Sinua's Sacrifice. There's just a number of things that won't be eligible for this list. So those are kind of the rules that I I set for myself when, when building this out. But where do I start, right? If I've if I have 66 games that I've beaten, and that's not even including anything that I've beaten digitally, because I don't tend to catalog anything that I own through um, a digital format on PlayStation or Xbox, where do I start? How do I get that that framework of games? I basically went through the entirety of my PlayStation profile 
filtered on PlayStation 4 to really get an understanding of what is every PlayStation 4 game I've basically ever played to figure out if it'd be eligible. I also spent a great deal of time over behind me looking at my shelf and kind of thumbing through each individual game and figuring out is this something that would potentially be possible for my top 25 list. And what's important to also understand is that when I had originally kind of pitched this idea to uh, Twitter, there was a poll that I posted on both my YouTube channel and Twitter. It was originally just going to be a top 10 games list. And the moment I looked at my shelf, the moment I started going through my PSN profile, it would have been an impossibility to whittle down my favorite PlayStation 4 games to just a list of 10. That eventually evolved into a list of 20. And then I still thought that would be too tough, so it evolved into a list of 25 games. And so I thought, well, let's let's try and pull down a list of 50 games that I've played over the course of having a PlayStation 4. And let's then do our best to whittle down that list of 50 games down to 25. So that is exactly what we're going to do today. This will be a two part process. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go over here. I have already pulled down a list of the 50 games that are going to be eligible. These are the games that when I look back on the PlayStation 4 are either some of my favorites. I just have very fond memories of either or of playing some of these specific games. Some of the games uh, are things that I've streamed back in 2020 or somewhere in between. So we're going to go through each of these individual games and we're going to determine whether or not they are a lock. So they're making it to the top 25 in some way, shape or form. Maybe still need to think on it or uh, just a pass. Again, it was a fun time, a fun experience, but definitely not making it into the top 25. Once we lock in those 25 games, then we have to go through the excruciating process of actually formally ranking them for my top 25, which again, you probably already know what that list is. I do not. So we're going to have some fun with this. It goes without saying that this is my list. You are probably already looking through here and saying like, oh my gosh, really Rusty? You're, you're going to consider ukulele? Ukulele is a contender for a, t yes, it is. Whose channel do you think you're on right now? This is Relui. We love our 3D platformers. We love our jank. We love our licensed stuff. We love our Ubisoft open world so this is my list. This is not the definitive top 25 PlayStation 4 games. You can go to IGN, you can go to Game Informer, you can go to other uh, games media outlets to get those definitive rankings. This is my list. We're going to have some fun with this. So hopefully, you know, you have this up on your browser. You're playing some games. This finds you well. I'm going to drink coffee here at five o'clock in the evening because I too like to live dangerously sometimes. First up, Assassin's Creed Origins. Now, if you don't listen to my podcast with Talking Brothers, you will not know that last year was a pretty difficult year for my wife and I. We had some really challenging things going on with our house and just some other personal stuff. And so I needed some escapism. I needed an open world to get lost in and the Assassin's Creed series came in real strong. I think in a matter of like eight months, I... I beat like six Assassin's Creed games. It was it was actually kind of stupid. And Assassin's Creed Origins quickly became my favorite Assassin's Creed game in the entire series. Which I had sworn off around AC3. I got halfway through the game and it like glitched out or something. So I'm like, I'm done with this. But Assassin's Creed Origins was really special because I've always had a fascination with ancient Egypt. Love the Brendan Fraser mummy movies growing up. And so to be able to go into a giant open world exploring all of ancient Egypt, not to mention a surprisingly compelling story. I don't think the Assassin's Creed stories are anything to write home about more often than not, but Origins really took me by surprise, quickly became my favorite AC game. And honestly, if they came out with a PS5 remaster, I would happily 100% the game and play it again. That's absolutely a lock. If you've not played an Assassin's Creed game before and you're looking to get, get into the series, or maybe you've played an older Assassin's Creed game, 
like one, two, brotherhood, and you're like, ah, what's a great place to jump back in? Origins. You got to do it. Assassin's Creed Syndicate. You know, if someone said, Rusty Quick, what are your top three AC games? I would say Origins, Brotherhood, and then probably Syndicate. Loved exploring Industrial Revolution London, having two main protagonists to play as, a brother and a sister. And there was also a grappling hook in this one. So running around London and jumping from rooftop to rooftop using that grappling hook was such a blast. However, I don't want to have two AC games on my top 25 list. Not because I'm ashamed of it, but just because there's so much good stuff here. So this is going to be a pass, but it's less of a reflection on the game itself and more that uh, we need to make room for some of this other stuff. It's also worth noting that Austin Winery of Journey and Abzu and other game fame, he composed the soundtrack to Syndicate and it's excellent, excellent stuff. Now there are some games that are going to be on this tier list that I think need no introduction and I don't even think are worth spending a ton of time debating whether or not they're a lock or a maybe. Bloodborne is absolutely one of those games. Has to be on there. Freaking amazing. I mean, it is just so good. I love how swift the combat is compared to some of the more heavier Dark Souls, Dark Souls 2 combat can be. You got to master that dodge roll. Some of the most epic boss battles, not only in the Souls series, but just in games in general. Excellent stuff. Absolutely a lock. Dishonored. This is an interesting one. Uh, one of the first few handful of games that I played on my PS4, because I'd never played it on the PS3 or 360. And uh, I love my stealth games. And what a gross world to run around in. Uh, love the blink mechanic where you can kind of teleport to different places, use rats to kind of kill your enemies. It is it was so fun. And I think I played this around the time when Dishonored 2 came out. So I played both back to back and was just really a good time. But I don't know if this is a lock. It's, it's really good, but I think this is going to sit in maybe territory for right now. Dark Souls 3 is another one. Because we have Bloodborne on the list, I don't know if we'll be able to make room for it. It's definitely not a pass. It's going into maybe. Because Dark Souls 3 is, is so good. I mean, it is outside of Bloodborne, I think the most streamlined, not streamlined, but mechanically tight Soulsborne game to that point. Obviously, Elden Ring has kind of surpassed that, but to this point, Dark Souls 3 was on another level. And what I love about the Soulsborne games in general is just whenever I'm playing that, that type of a game, my brother-in-law and I are typically playing the game alongside each other. We're texting each other, figuring out those areas in the game where you can grind a bunch of souls and level up and then just go annihilate a boss. And then you go to the next boss and it annihilates you and you kind of rinse and repeat that that exercise. But Dark Souls 3, really memorable boss fights in that one as well. So that'll that'll sit in maybe territory for now. Next up, we have Erica. This is an interesting one. I actually streamed this game and it's kind of a full motion video. Actual actors are recorded and it's a bit of a suspense thriller type of experience where you have to, there's some, some QTE type stuff where you have to make quick decisions, um, depending on your decisions, literally alters the outcome of the rest of the game or just how certain people respond. A goofy story. The end is kind of bonkers. Like, I don't even remember what the heck happened, but it was kind of insane. And it kind of gets in some weird supernatural territory, but if you're into... Um, stuff like Until Dawn or the Dark Pictures Anthology type games, I would definitely give Erica a try. It was free on PlayStation Plus a while back. And it's worth playing through, especially around the spooky season, because it is it's a little intense. Not scary necessarily, but it's it's a bit of a thriller. This unfortunately is a pass, though. This is this is not something that I think is even considered into maybe territory. It's just a really memorable game 
from the PlayStation 4 games that I've played. Worth checking out. Everybody's Golf, that is going into absolute lock territory. I love the Hot Shots Golf series. Everybody's Golf was, that's what it was known as in Japan. And then for whatever reason, they didn't call this Hot Shots Golf 6 here um, in the West. They called it Everybody's Golf. And also one of the of the first few games I bought for the PlayStation 4, I played Hot Shots Golf 3 and 4 quite a bit with my dad growing up. So um, with each successor PlayStation console, it's just always been... It's been fun to be able to anticipate a game in this series. Um, just getting that kind of arcadey three button click system similar to your Mario Golf. Um, but a big bummer that Clap Hands, I think, is completely gone or they're exclusively developing for mobile platforms now. Just a bit disappointing because it'd be really great to have um, a Hot Shots Golf game to play on PlayStation 5. And this one was really neat too because. You got to create your own character. There's a bit of a, a hub area where you can run around and, and fish and drive around in a golf cart and um, do goofy animations to other NPCs in a similar way that you would in like a Fable game. It, there's a lot a lot more there than you would anticipate uh, for, for a golf game, but uh, it was really good stuff. Really good stuff. All right, we talked about it earlier. Love my Ubisoft open worlds. Gotta talk about Far Cry. Now... Far Cry 5, I have fond memories of because it was actually the first game I played when we moved into our house in 2020. So whenever I hear the soundtrack, I'm kind of almost nostalgic for that time period. But I didn't actually really enjoy the game itself that much. You can have a Jonestown situation, this cult leader in Montana. It was kind of fun to explore the open world and everything like that to play through the story, kind of go through the Far Cry motions. But the open world design was a bit different compared to Far Cry 3, 3 and 4. So I didn't enjoy it as much. So this is going into past territory. Far Cry 5, or Far Cry Primal, excuse me, on the other hand, kind of set in 10,000 BC, the black sheep of the series. I personally love this because instead of running around with a machine gun and grenades, you're running around with a bow and arrow and throwing beehives at people uh, in the form of a grenade, basically. It is so weird, goofy, you can tame like mountain lions and stuff like that. It's really neat. And it's a shame that I don't think it's sold as well as the mainline Far Cry game. So it's very unlikely that we'll get another game in the series. But I really like it for, for just how different it is. And it, it just really stands amongst the other Far Cry games as being something truly unique. Where I feel like they make very small iterations with, with the mainline game. So... I'm going to put Far Cry Primal into maybe territory for now. We'll see later on uh, if we can move it up to a lock. Final Fantasy 15. Wow. This is uh, this is also an interesting one to talk about while I'm playing 16. Because I feel like 16 does everything 15 was trying to do infinitely better. From a, a more action heavy combat side of things. Certainly from a storytelling perspective, music, oh, they're comparable, but music soundtracks of both games are pretty strong. But I think I like 15 more for the time I played it and less for the experience itself. What I mean by that is I played this game in 2020 when we were all in quarantine. We were all locked down. We couldn't go anywhere. So Final Fantasy 15 was a great game to play at that time because I got to hop in a car and go on a road trip with my buddies, basically. And that was something I couldn't do in the real world because I couldn't see my friends because COVID. So I think I look back on it fondly more because of that. I got to do what I couldn't do in my real life, but the game kind of allowed for me to do those types of things. And again, less, less for it actually being this compelling, memorable Final Fantasy experience. Don't get me wrong. I still enjoy my time with Final Fantasy 15. I still like it. Um, but when I think about the best in the franchise, 15 is definitely not going to be at the top of the list, especially the more I play 16, which is pretty freaking good. So with that being said, though, I mean, I still I still really enjoy my time with it. So we're going to put it in the maybe territory for right now. 
7 Remake. Oh, that's an absolute lock. I'll also mention that I'm not ordering these yet. Again, we'll, we'll do that later once we, we have our 25 games in lock category. So don't think that necessarily 7 Remake is going to be behind Assassin's Creed Origins or or above it. It's it's just, again, it's a lock right now. Um, I talked about in a recent YouTube video of mine that my first time seeing Final Fantasy VII was at one of my really good friends' house growing up. Um, I remember going to Game Crazy. My mom bought me a copy, and I just didn't get it at the time. The original, that is, because I was a young kid, uh, younger Rusty wasn't very good at games, and just the RPG systems of something like 7, 8, or 9 uh, was just too much for my little pea brain to understand at the time. So I never really got kind of got deep into that game, and uh, I've since tried it as an adult. I've gotten about 10, 12 hours into it, and I enjoy it, but 7 Remake is on another level. To kind of maintain the legacy of what kind of makes seven so special with its characters and Midgar and the soundtrack, but still pushing it forward in such a, a unique way with it being a more action RPG as opposed to the turn-based combat and stretching a, a 30 hour story, 30, 40 hour story into probably what will be an over 100 hour game. It's pretty, pretty interesting as well but uh seven remake is just special stuff it's just really special stuff so that's that's definitely a lock next up we have theater rhythm final bar line came out earlier this year i don't think we have a ps5 version of this so i'm including it and just a terrific rhythm game of course showcasing 300 plus songs from across the entirety of the final fantasy series i've already put 50 plus hours into the game this year and I know it's something I will continue to retreat to because even if I can't start a new Final Fantasy game given the the time sink it's nice to be able to jump into this game and play three to five songs from some of my favorite Final Fantasy games like 13 like 9 or jumping and experiencing music from games I've never played before like Final Fantasy 8 or Mystic Quest and discovering how those games have some real banger songs. It's just so good. And I, I, of course, really enjoyed my time with Curtain Call and the original Theater Rhythm on the 3DS. But that's that's a lock. That has to be on here. Ghost of Tsushima is a, another lock. My 2020 game of the year. I think it needs a little introduction. I mean, it was just it's been so cool to see Sucker Punch evolve as a developer from something like Rocket Robot on Wheels on the N64 Sly Cooper, the infamous games, and eventually something like Ghost. I really hope we get another one during the PlayStation 5 generation. Just so fun exploring that world, learning the finer complexities of the different stances of combat. I can never get into Neo. I feel like the learning curve there was too steep. Voice crack. More so because of the, the difficulty, the Souls-like difficulty of Neo. Um, Ghost thankfully didn't have that level of difficulty, but um, a cinematic score, compelling story, not just the main story, but even some of the the side stuff, just the attention to detail in that world was phenomenal and uh, something I, I wouldn't mind replaying someday. Jin Sakai. Excellent game. God of War also needs no introduction. That's a lock. Uh, interesting what kind of story about this one though i started streaming this which was kind of a mistake because i was more focused on keeping up with chat than i was listening to the dialogue between kratos and atreus but thankfully i eventually stopped streaming it returned to it several months later and played it to completion but again i i didn't play this at launch so it kind of soured my taste of the game overall because I broke up my my playing of it in, in different blocks of time, so it wasn't something like it wasn't something that I played beginning to end. So the experience wasn't as fresh as it could have been. But still, what a wild way to reinvent a character. Santa Monica Studios, they're doing great things. They are doing great things. Ragnarok, I would argue even better. 
but that was more because again i played that game beginning to end but 2018 god of war is still a really phenomenal experience gris or gree this was a, a really neat kind of puzzle platformer indie title with a watercolor aesthetic very short beat it in about three hours i included this more to just give a shout out to some indie titles uh, less because it's going to make it on my list but my wife is also very fond of this game as well it's good it's a pass but um i definitely recommend it especially if you can pick it up for probably rel relatively cheap you can get it on all current generation consoles highly recommend it heavy rain oh so my first rule was not including remasters of games i've already played before i never played uh, heavy rain on the playstation 3 but oh my goodness i streamed this game and what a freaking ride that was quantic dream they are uh on another level i still need to play beyond two souls and um what's that other one uh, I'm going to scream it later. I can't remember the title, but everyone's probably going into maybe territory. There are just moments in this game from a story standpoint that are wild. And the reveal towards the end of the game, kind of shocking. If you were in my discord and you, you know, the emote of me kind of like covering my mouth of like in shock, that was actually a screenshot of my reaction to that moment while I was streaming the game that my buddy Frantic or Josh, he uh, he made into an emote. But uh, really interesting how they have all kinds of these different stories playing out and how they're all kind of threaded together by the end to have a thrilling conclusion to the story. Everyone's good stuff. Probably in maybe territory. I don't know if that's going to be... I don't know if we can make room for that in the top 25. Horizon Zero Dawn, that's a lock. That is a lock. Talking about interesting evolutions for developers to go from Kill Zone to Horizon, where you're running around a post apocalyptic or futuristic open world with mechanical dinosaurs. What an interesting idea that was. And it hit. We got Forbidden West. That's also great too, uh, but kickstarting Aloy's journey in Zero Dawn, I actually prefer. I enjoy the story quite a bit more than I did in Forbidden West, and um, yeah, it was just a fun open world to get lost in, upgrading your bow and arrow, taking down these mechanical dinosaurs, scanning them to identify where their vulnerabilities were, and landing that perfect shot to clip off their armor. So rewarding, so satisfying. That's a lock. I th do I want to just definitively say this is a lock too? We're going to put Jedi Fallen Order, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order in maybe territory, but that was a game that leading up to its launch, my brother-in-law and I were like, nah, we'll wait for a sale. We're not going to pick this up day one. He ended up picking it up day one. He came over to my place and we played it for like eight hours straight. We were obsessed. Integrating kind of that Dark Souls combat Fresh new story set in the already existing Star Wars universe. Kind of threading this between the events of Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope was really neat as a huge Star Wars fan that grew up with the prequels. And of course, the original trilogy. Cal Kestis, great protagonist. Uh, like Zero Dawn, though, I actually prefer the original to its sequel. But I'm still coming down from Jedi Survivor, so we'll see if that holds up in the future. But... Uh, there's no better game that makes you feel like a Jedi than Fallen Order. It was it was so fun. Jank and all. Um, I think the the performance issues, glitching through walls and stuff like that, honestly added to the experience in a, in a fun way. Um, but it obviously has since been been polished quite a bit. Oh my gosh, what is absolutely a lock is Journey. My complete playthrough of it is on my YouTube channel. You can check it out. Surprisingly, one of my most watched videos on my YouTube channel. I've gotten so many comments talking about how their words, not mine, 
one of the best Let's Plays out there on YouTube. I don't know. I'll let you be the judge of that. But I did have a very unique experience playing Journey where if you've never played it, you don't know, but you are paired up with a random person around the world who's also playing this game. You're kind of a wandering traveler and you're making your way up the summit, up this mountain. And I was paired up with someone who was also playing it for the first time. So we were kind of wandering this world, discovering the gameplay mechanics, trying to figure out where to go, collecting the, the different scarf um, extensions. And there were times where we kind of got too far from each other. And I was worried that I was going to be separated and I'd be paired with a new person, but I made it through the entirety of the game with that person. And it was just one of the most memorable experiences playing a game ever. One, because of streaming it on Twitch and having a number of really great friends watching me and kind of encouraging me through the experience, but also just how everything played out. It was really special. That's a lock. Kingdom Hearts 3, come on now. A PlayStation game list is not complete for me without a little Kingdom Hearts love. Kingdom Hearts 3, I feel like with each passing year, I grow more and more fond of it. Less of a focus on story. Say what you will about that. You, they kind of just crunch or crunch in all the story at the very tail end of the experience, which I'm kind of okay with. It means come on kingdom hearts story is just nonsensical it's 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 stupid it's just stupid you play kingdom hearts to run around the disney worlds with your boys donald and goofy get new keyblades whacking the heartless leveling up that's what kingdom hearts is all about and uh Kingdom Hearts 3 has some really special worlds. I, I like the emphasis on the Pixar stuff with Toy Story and Monsters, Inc. and Big Hero 6, Tangled, Frozen. A lot of fun running around those worlds. And the combat system has never been better. I think the, the theatrics of some of it can be a bit over the top at times with um, the carnival and the roller coaster stuff, but... It's still a lot of fun to play. It's still a lot of fun to play. So Kingdom Hearts 3, a definite lock. Speaking of definite locks, let's just put this one in the front. Life of Black Tiger. There are probably like three people in the world that know what this game is. I had to include this because <laughs> good pal Pete Dorr was streaming this many years ago when I first started following him on Twitch. It is this super jank game where you play as a tiger and there is a single player story that you can play as. I will not spoil the details because you need to play through this. You need to play through this on your own. All right. And and see the tragic events that take place in, in Black Tiger's life. But no, it is, it is honestly awful. Like it is so bad. The... The translation from wherever this game was developed to uh, the West is and it's like whatever script they wrote in whatever language from where the game was developed, they threw in Google Translate and it's just bad. It's just so bad. But where this game shines is in its ability to play multiplayer with friends. There is one server. There is one room. And when P was streaming it, a bunch of people that were in his Twitch stream jumped in, were playing this game. And it's just this open sandbox where you get to play as a variety of different wildlife animals, rabbits, foxes, tigers, bears, whatever it might be. And you're just running around in this open sandbox and some of them can kill you. Others have no ability to attack, but we like made our own game out of this game. And some of us would all start like next to this tree and there's this mountain off in the distance. And it was like the first one that got to the top one, or we did like a death match. There were no actual, actual settings from multiplayer side of things. We just kind of made our own fun with it. But, um, but no life of black tiger is, is genuinely awful and it's a pass, but I'll never forget that time where I played it during Pete's stream. 
Speaking of games that we have to pass on, Man of Madon, Dark Pictures Anthology. I want to include it because I do like how many games we've gotten in this anthology series. I love the kind of emphasis on continuing to kind of ride the wave of uh, Until Dawn, which we'll get to later, of your 80s horror flick where you have a bunch of kids that go to a cabin and you have to make decisions that are literally life or death situations. Um, they're just very campy, very fun, especially when you have a bunch of friends around. But Man of Adon, from a story side of things, just really fell flat, especially when I was intrigued with the twists and turns of what was going on. But when the reveal happens, it's kind of just like, oh, really? That's just that's just kind of lame. That's just kind of lame. But still recommend him. I, I need to uh, get around to playing some of the the other ones that have come out more recently. Marvel Spider-Man. Like Bloodborne. Like God of War. That's a lock. Up until this point, I think Spider-Man 2, based on the Sam Raimi classic with Tobey Maguire, was the best Spider-Man game. Because you got to freely wander around New York City and fly around. But Insomniac took that to another level with Marvel Spider-Man in 2018 on the PlayStation 4. I've played through this game three times. Played through it on PS4. Or don't know, maybe... No, yeah, three times. Played through it on PS4. When the PS5 remaster came out, I was not a dirty, dirty trophy person and import my save to just get an automatic platinum trophy. I played through the entirety of the game again, got the platinum, and then for some new game plus specific trophies, I played through the game again on ultimate difficulty, the hardest difficulty, which was surprisingly a lot of fun. Sorry, we had to update the song. It was getting a little too crazy for my liking. But yeah, Marvel Spider-Man is phenomenal. A little bit bloaty. I, I won't lie. There's maybe, maybe too many optional quest to to pop that platinum but i think it's most fun when you have to do like the photo op stuff take certain pictures of like the avengers tower or certain monuments around new york and be in full swing and then snapping the photograph or collecting all the backpacks unlocking all the different suits that's when spider-man's at its best and uh a great story too i mean it was Kind of plays out in three different phases and definitely gets me excited for Spider-Man 2 in the fall. Cannot wait for that. Next up we have Monster Hunter World. Where's this going to go? I'm sorry, Ryan, brother-in-law, if you're watching, that's going to be a pass for me. I just don't think Monster Hunter's for me. I appreciate for what it does and I know it has a rather dedicated fan base but I'm just not into the gameplay loop of continuing to grind the same monsters over and over and over again just so that I can get a new fancy set of armor or my palico to look a little bit different or a new weapon however I love the monster designs I like the actual act of slaying the monster but I kind of need a story there. I want to be able to explore the open world a bit more. And it's very much come back to the hub world, make your food, go out in the world, slay the monster, get its parts, come back and craft something new. Rinse and repeat. And that just is not an exciting gameplay loop. But if you played Monster Hunter, good on you. Keep playing Monster Hunter. It's just not for me. Next up, we have new Super Lucky's Tale, a super charming 3D platformer. I'm going to put this in maybe territory for now. It's one of the best three platformers that I think we've we've gotten in the past decade. That's not a Mario game. Great emphasis on lots of collectibles. It's a level based platformer where you kind of go A to B. And as you go A to B, it, each level ha kind of has a, a different set of collectibles. But when the game is most fun is when you're collecting these coins, you're outfitting Lucky with all kinds of fun little goofy outfits, and and he's just so dang cute. Look at the little face. He's just so dang cute. Um, yeah, it's just a great little 3D platformer. So 
we'll leave that in maybe territory for now. Something that I think is also firmly in maybe territory, Nino Kuni 2. I couldn't really get into the first Nino Kuni because it wasn't that I couldn't wrap my head around the combat system. I got it. You had these familiars, these Pokemon like creatures that you tamed and used in combat. I just didn't find it very fun, to be honest with you. Nino Kuni 2, on the other hand, I liked because it had a bit of a, a Tales of action RPG combat system. There were some other neat mechanics where you had some real time strategy elements. You also had, uh, as the name would sort of imply, you were playing as this up and coming aspiring king named Evan, and there was a kingdom building, almost The Sims like, where you had to accumulate enough money to build a barracks or uh, a number of other different buildings in this city, and then you'd go and find NPCs that were, um, they had the skills to basically manage that particular building. Uh, very addicting gameplay loop. Very addicting. And I don't really remember much about the story. I don't I don't think that was too much to write home about, but it was it was just the gameplay and that Studio Ghibli like aesthetic that Nino Kuni is of course known for that I really took a liking to, more so than the first. So it's in maybe territory for now. Old Man's Journey. Pretty fun indie game, emotional story, great soundtrack. From a gameplay side of things, you kind of it's almost point and click in the sense where you kind of drag up and down the the environment or the levels so that the man can kind of navigate and walk up the level to continue to progress the story. You can beat this one in two to three hours. Kind of brings uh, a bit of a tear to your eye towards the end as indie games often do. I enjoyed my time with this one. I wanted to highlight it because again, indie games don't always get enough love. And um, I, I definitely encourage you to check it out on, on Switch, PlayStation, Xbox, Steam. It's going to be a pass from a top 25 perspective, but it's a banger of an indie that you should play. Next up, we have The Order 1886, Ready at Dawn's cover-based third-person shooter. I like this game quite a bit. It gets a pretty bad rap by a lot of people. I think this was a launch game for PS4. It was a near launch title. Graphically, when this game was first showcased, it looks so good. I still think it looks really good. I, I played it a couple years ago. Got the Platinum Trophy. Kind of this Victorian era London setting, a Knights of the Round Table type of deal. You're fighting Lycans and Van Helsing type vibes with this one. But I don't know, 8 to 12 hour, third person, cover based shooter. It's good fun. It's an enjoyable game. Not perfect. Certainly not bad. I think we're going to put this in pass for now. Maybe we'll, we'll put it this in maybe. There is a possibility that this makes it into the top 25. We'll see. Play the 8 or 1886 people. It's a good game. Outlast one of the creepiest games I've ever played. Played this with my brother-in-law. We were both sitting on the couch together. As scary as I'll get out, you are using a... You're a reporter, and you're exploring this apparently abandoned insane asylum. And because you're in a reporter, you're seeing everything through the lens of a video camera. And so you kind of have that green screen when it's super dark, as you can kind of tell from the cover here limited battery packs, and there's no way to fight the enemies in this game. You can either run or you can hide, and it is as terrifying as it sounds. I don't think this will make top 25. This is a pass, but if this was a top 25 horror game on PS4, it would definitely be a lock. Highly recommended for spooky season. Next up, we have Poi. Anybody out there played Poi before? All three of you. This is another 3D platformer. A little bit different than New Super Lucky's Tale. This one's very much like Super Mario 64 where you go into a level, you're looking for a particular star or kind of main collectible. And once you do it or collect it, kind of spit you back out, keep going back in for more. And yeah, this is just a little hidden gem of a 3D platformer. Highly recommend to folks. Get on Switch, PlayStation 4. It's a fun little game. 
very colorful. But I don't think this is quite as good as New Super Lucky's Tale, even if it borrows kind of a level design in character movement and platforming from a Mario 64 type of game. It's just doesn't quite have the same level of charm as a new Super Lucky's Tale. Rainbow Six Siege is basically on here so I can complain. I was such a big fan of Vegas 1 and 2 on Xbox 360, and I was hoping to get something resembling that in Siege, but there was no single player campaign, no ability to create your own character, and no terrorist hunt. There were these kind of predetermined missions or objectives that were specific to your character builds, but I don't know, it's difficult to explain. It just was not what I wanted to be. A heavy emphasis on online multiplayer and the online community for Siege was so bad, so bad early on. You jump into a multiplayer match and you'd have like these 14 year old kids just trying to kill you and not trying to accomplish the objective. It was so frustrating. If there was anything less than pass, it'd be there. Ratchet and Clank 2016, kind of a, a reimagining or remake of the original Ratchet and Clank game. This is excellent. This is excellent stuff. This is going to go in maybe for now, but this is a more likely lock for me. Surprisingly, if I'm not mistaken, the only Ratchet and Clank game over the PS4 generation, which is wild because we got four or five of them on the PS2. We got a ton of Ratchet and Clank on PS3. And I'm pretty sure we only got one on the PS4 and it was basically a remake. Um, I played through this game like three or four times to get the Platinum Trophy. What's really fun about a lot of the Ratchet and Clank games, particularly the PS2 era ones, is that it, there was a New Game Plus feature. And so, you keep going through the game over and over again with all of your upgraded weapons, and it got to a point where you were almost speedrunning by your second or third playthrough because you could just blow everything up with, with the weapons that you got. But collecting studs in a similar way to like the Lego, the Lego games, just blowing everything up, collecting studs, your pal's Ratchet and Clank, can't beat it, good stuff. All right, this is when things are gonna get a little bit challenging because I feel like all three of these games, maybe less of three remake, but certainly two remake and seven are deserving of being in my top 25 list. I never played two or three, so playing those for the first time in remake fashion was something else. Two, playing as Leon and Claire, they're two separate campaigns, but Mr. X, when you make it to that police station and he crashes through the wall, oh my gosh. And then never really knowing when he's going to be following you around the police station. And anytime those footsteps start, oh my gosh, just immediate beads of sweat, panic, anxiety. The feeling that they're, they're of course, going for. Um, but as a player, it's, it's absolutely terrifying but so good at the same time. Two's gonna go into maybe. Three, kind of more of the high octane action with Nemesis, playing as Jill. A lot of fun, I, I really enjoyed my time with three. A little bit shorter, I don't know why people are complaining. Short horror games are kind of where it's at, in my opinion. I think I think we're going to have to pass on RE3 Remake, though. So great. So great. But I don't think it quite makes it into the maybe or lock territory. And then Resident Evil 7. I say this. I've said this so many times on my podcast. This is the scariest experience I've ever had in my life. Video games, TV, movies. I don't care what it is. Even when I watch John Carpenter's Halloween, 1978's Halloween at six years old, Pet Cemetery when I was six years old. Terrifying. I got nightmares. Tim Curry's It. It's him playing Pennywise when I was younger. Watching that movie terrified me. But like, as a grown adult man playing Resident Evil 7 with the lights turned off, my wife was in the other room. She wouldn't even come around this game. 
That was so freaky. It's going into a locked territory, not just because it scared the living daylights out of me, but I think the switch from third person kind of action shooter, what Resident Evil had become with four and five, and certainly six. Let's do you see six anywhere on this list? Absolutely not. Get out of here with that. Going to the first person perspective, more of an emphasis on storytelling, playing as Ethan Winters, going to that mansion, figuring out why this family had gone absolutely nuts. Speaking of things chasing you around, the dad when he's chasing you around, freaky as I'll get out. And how everything kind of comes to a close. And the story continues in Resident Evil 8. It's just so good. And I do, I do want to punish myself and play that in VR someday. I'm planning to. So 7 goes into locked territory, for sure. Next up we have Rise of the Tomb Raider. I really enjoyed the first one and kind of this rebooting of the series for, for Lara Croft, Rise and Shadow. But I couldn't tell you a darn thing that happens in these games. Not a single thing. But I really enjoyed my time playing them. They kind of, they kind of mix the crafting systems of The Last of Us, kind of the the cinematic set piece moments of your Uncharted games. They were a lot of fun, and, and Rise especially. I kind of remember being kind of the Uncharted two to that trilogy. It was definitely the highlight game. Shadow. I don't remember what happened. I just remember the story went in some like B-movie sci-fi afternoon flick territory where it was just nonsense. Can I put this in maybe though, if I don't even remember anything about it really outside of having fun with it, I think we're going to put it in maybe, but that's, that's probably leaning more towards pass. If I'm being honest. Next up, one of my favorite games of the past decade, Middle Earth Shadow of War. I didn't include Shadow of Mordor because I originally played that on Xbox 360, which was a mess. Always should have waited to play Mordor on the PS4 or Xbox One, but I played through that janky mess on 360, and then I played it again, of course, on PlayStation 4. But Shadow of War takes the foundation of the Nemesis system and everything that was good about Mordor and ups the ante to another degree where you have these like kingdom battles where you're either defending your own keep or you're going to overthrow one of the territories in Middle Earth. And like just the scale of these battles really helps to almost recreate stuff like Helm the Battle of Helm's Deep and the Battle of Minas Tirith and Pelennor Fields. Like you feel the intensity and the scope of those types of battles while you're on the field as Talion, scaling a building and eventually kind of dethroning from a nemesis system side of things whoever's at the top of the food chain at the very ends um of those battles it was so cool and a fitting conclusion to Italian story although i feel like it's 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 left open for interpretation to a certain extent where if they wanted to do more they absolutely could and i hope they do at the very least we need to get current generation remasters of these games because I want to play through them again. They are so good. Not enough people talk about them, even though they critically reviewed well and I think sold relatively well. I just don't hear people talking about Shadow of Mordor or Shadow of War enough. And we need more of that nemesis system in other games. That's a lock, 100%. Skylar and Plux, a fun little 3D platformer that really resembles from a, a character movement side of things. Jack and Daxter, the Precursor Legacy. I put this on here largely to highlight a hidden gem 3D platformer, but also to have a tragic goodbye because I think this may have been exclusive to PlayStation or PSN or whatever and is no longer available on the, the PlayStation Store. Never got a physical edition. Um, it's not a great 3D platformer, but it was a fun no gimmicks just kind of your bare bones collect-a-thon 3d platformer just a few short levels you could beat it in five to six hours but it had a lot of charm it was a fun little game and it's a shame that it's um it's kind of gone it's kind of gone now speaking of charming 3d platformers we've got tamarin this is going into maybe territory for sure beautiful looking game 
gorgeous. You can get it on Xbox, you can get it on PlayStation, you can get it on Steam. Phenomenal soundtrack by the wonderful David Wise of Donkey Kong Country fame. And there are like these vast open environments where you're running around as this little tamarind monkey collecting a bunch of fun collectibles and this wholesome little world. Where the game suffers is that like directionally you just never really know where you're meant to go. There's no fast travels. You can often, you can easily get lost in the game. And it gets even weirder because this is almost like a spiritual successor to the kind of cult classic on the N64 Jet Force Gemini. There are moments where you're running on all fours as this cute monkey, collecting bugs and little fun collectibles. And then you'll go into this building, you'll get, you'll get on your hind legs, and you whip out like this little um, blaster gun, and you start shooting these giant ants, these giant beetles and bugs. And all in an effort to kind of save your family, because your, your family has been taken by these bugs. It's so weird. It is so weird. Um... But it's a lot of fun. Again, if you can overlook a lot of that, I would say, poor game design because you can't fast travel and you're off, oftentimes backtracking, not really sure where you're supposed to go next to kind of cue that next moment or save that next family member. That can be frustrating at times, but it's still a beautiful looking 3D platformer and uh, one I also hear no one talking about. Speaking of games no one talks about, the Last of Us Part 2. This is definitely going into lock territory. I keep referencing my podcast, but if you've listened to it, you'll know that, uh, one, this game's punishing. Like, it just beats you down and continues to beat you down emotionally over and over and over again, rarely having moments of levity or peace and allowing you to catch your breath. Now, don't get me wrong, when they do, they are... They are beautiful moments that are often bringing a tear to your eye for a different reason than others. But I ended up finishing this game in like three days. I played it for like almost 10 hours a day, three days straight over the course of a weekend when it released. And did I enjoy my time with it? Yes. But again, it's just punishing. Hat off to Naughty Dog, though. They, they clearly committed to a narrative that they wanted to tell, and I think as difficult as it is to get through, it works. It's a lock. Speaking of... Am I going to lock this in right now? I think we're going to put it into maybe territory. I am looking at The Walking Dead, the complete series. All four seasons. Um, it's a kind of complete Clementine story. Maybe cheating a little bit, but I'm doing it. This is my list. People tend to talk about the first season of The Walking Dead. I think it was up for Game of the Year. Of course, Lee and Clementine, their story. As the zombie outbreak kind of breaks out in real time. Similar to your Until Dawn's and Dark Pictures anthology. You have to make key decisions in the moment. You have a very limited amount of time to make those decisions. And depending on what you do, you often piss people off. You are often the reason that certain people die or live. It's very tough. And after the first season, I really don't hear many people talk about the other seasons because there's three of them there. And while two, I think, is a pretty strong follow up to the first, three kind of goes in a bit of a different direction. It's kind of like meh. But I think it all comes together in a pretty satisfying way in the fourth and final season especially since Skybound Games um, kind of dissolved while they were still finishing part three and four of the fourth and final season. Um, so say what you will about that. That was a little upsetting. And I'll never forget that first season. Lee kind of just showing Clementine the ropes. And you kind of see the fruits of a lot of that in the future seasons. It's it's so good. It's so good. If you have been waiting to play the other seasons of The Walking Dead, wait no longer. Please, please go play it. It's so good. And speaking of things that are so good, The Witcher 3. 
This was also a game I played in 2020, like Final Fantasy 15. Played a lot of big, big open world games in that, that year. And I think that people many look at Witcher 3 in the same regard as like a Skyrim or a Breath of the Wild. It's just overwhelming to pick up and commit to that game and that world and the story. But I'm so glad I did. The rumors are true. It's excellent. Even the side quests are just as compelling as the main quest. Trying to figure out who you're going to rom romance as Geralt, Yennefer, Triss. Triss? That's her name, right? Again, it's been three years since I've played this. I never could get in the second one because the complexities of the combat, I just... There was too much going on with the alchemy type stuff and the sword fighting. But they really streamlined things in a way in Wild Hunt that it's... It's, it's not overwhelming. You can also play on the easiest difficulty setting to make things even easier. But exploring every square inch of that world, its unique soundtrack, and again, from a story side of things, it was just an incredible game. Looking forward to eventually getting around to playing uh, Cyberpunk now that that's has been patched and stuff. But Witcher 3 is good. Another lock, Uncharted 4. Like some of these other games that I've talked about that are locked, this one also needs no introduction. When you think of like perfect endings, I always look at something like Breaking Bad. I don't know how they could have ended that show any better. I don't know how you end a series of games like Uncharted any better than they did with the fourth and final game. And God bless Elena for the patience that she has for Nathan Drake. Let me just say that for a second. Um, yeah, I don't even want to say much about Uncharted 4 just because I know there are people who haven't played it. And I can gush all day long about how great some of those story moments are. But at risk of spoiling it for others, I won't. But it's amazing. It deserves all the praise it's gotten over the years. And if you haven't played it, please do. This is really tough for me, though. Right, because we talked about only kind of wanting one Resident Evil game, only one, wanting one Soulsborne game, but Lost Legacy, the more I think about it and the more I play it, because I've played Lost Legacy three times now, like it is right up there with four. It is that good. And it's such a great bookend to the fourth game in the sense that one you're not playing as Nathan Drake but you get to see a deeper side to some of those characters that you you did care about in the other games like Chloe and Nadine um and it's kind of just this bite-sized Uncharted game too it doesn't overstay its welcome it's not too short the story is really strong and just seeing Chloe and Nadine working together over the course of that game and kind of getting over this like kind of grumpy sister relationship that they have at the beginning to really becoming friends towards the ends. It's a special, special game. That's maybe territory. Gosh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to find a way to make that a lock though. Until dawn, this is going into maybe territory for sure. I need to play this again because my impressions of it are not fresh enough I think for me to to like share my opinions on it in a, a justifiable way if that makes sense but I remember unlike Man of Adon like the decisions you had to make in this game were so much harder and I was so much more invested in the story and I feel like beginning to end the story is compelling up until the very end where holy moly everyone kind of congregates back at the cabin and if you played it you know it goes down there it's freaking wild and let's just say that not many people made it out alive for me and that was disappointing another reason to return to it it's good stuff though wolfenstein new order and new colossus one of these games is going into a lock and one of them is going to a pass the question is which one i feel like just for how over the top New Colossus is. Like it, it is literally insane, the stuff that happens in that game. 
and how it comes to a close and we still haven't gotten a proper third game yet. It kills me. Machine games, Bethesda, please. Let's, let's not make us wait too much longer. But I had never played a Wolfenstein before and I like bought New Order on a whim. And I, I can't really remember specifically, but like I feel like I, I beat this game in like a, a weekend. Like I was obsessed. The gunplay is so satisfying and fun. I love how you can go into a room and just go crazy dual machine gun or dual shotgun just lighten people up or if you want to you can be quiet about it you can stealthily make your way around levels and take out each guy individually and I love when they give you the option to do that in games like Dishonored like Last of Us I think New Order has to go in lock and New Col Colossus goes in pass but they're both so good similar to Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War I don't hear people in my inner circle talking about the Wolfenstein games enough. I need more people talking about those games. Because they are incredible. Don't play Youngblood though. That That is terrible. That game is awful. That game is awful. Speaking of things that are not awful. Ukulele the Impossible Air and Ukulele. Similarly to Wolfenstein, one of these games is going into a lock. And one of these games is going to a pass. I think Impossible Air is a lock and Ukulele is a pass. The joke's on all of you. I actually never enjoyed Ukulele. I honestly think it's one of the worst 3D platformers to ever come out. Sharing a seat with Bubsy 3D. It's... I'm, who am I kidding? Come on now. Ukulele's going up in the top. That's a lock. Let's just put that right in the front there. Impossible Air. Arguably the better game. If you like Donkey Kong Country, play Impossible Air. David Wise even composes the soundtrack to a lot of that game. It's so good. Your 2D platformer, a lot of the collectibles are, um, from a level design standpoint, it's set up in a similar way to your Donkey Kong Countries in terms of where those collectibles are, how you navigate the level from A to B, stuff like that. It's good. I still have not beaten the impossible layer though. That final level is relentless, brutal. Some might even say unfair. I'll get the platinum trophy eventually. Ukulele is special to me for a number of reasons. One, I remember vividly going into a GameStop, one of the uh, most memorable GameStop experiences I've had in the past decade. I can count about two fingers when they have been memorable, but I went in there was someone super cool working there and she was like, what kind of games do you like? And she wasn't like product pushing or anything like that. But I said, really into RPGs, really into 3D platformers. She pulled off Nino Kuni 2 off the shelf. She pulled Ukulele off the shelf and she's like, you should give these two a try. And I was in college at the time when all the Kickstarter stuff was going on for Ukulele and it being kind of the spiritual successor to Banjo-Kazooie. And so I just never got around to playing it until I, of course, got the PS4, went into GameStop that day, and walked out with a special edition copy of Nino Kuni 2 and a regular copy of Ukulele, and I had a great time with both. So, there we go. Ease 8 Lacrimosa of Donna. I unfortunately haven't beaten this game. I wanted to round out a nice clean list of 50 games, and I wanted to shout out Ease 8 because it's excellent from what I've played. And... I look at the E series as kind of like my comfort feud RPGs were they're just low stress. They're lots of fun. Typically not a story I, I really care about, but the combat's always so addicting and fun. The music is always literally electrifying with the guitar riffs and all that kind of stuff going on. I need to get back to this one. I need to get back to that one and eventually play nine. But that is where we're at. We have our locks. We have our maybes. We have our passes. Let's see. How many locks do we have? One, two, three. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. We have room for seven more games. Let's let's first start removing some maybes. If Lost Legacy is up as a contender, a Tomb Raider cannot be. Let's just be honest with ourselves. 
I really do want to commit to the no no two games on the list. The only exception might be Final Fantasy. People are going to like rip me apart for putting Dark Souls 3 or putting Final Fantasy 15 on here instead of Dark Souls 3, but I think that might be where we're at. We'll see. Um, Tamarin, I love you dearly, and I hope more people play this game, but I don't think you're quite going to make the list when we have stuff like Ukulele and New Super Lucky's Tale here. And Ratchet and Clank for that matter. I also don't think Until Dawn and Heavy Rain because they kind of have similar vibes with their QTE, quick decision making, kind of a mystery, thriller, suspense, horror-esque type thing going on. So one of these has to drop. And I'm leaning towards Until Dawn dropping because I I streamed Heavy Rain and that was just so much more memorable. So I think we're going to drop Until Dawn. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Five of these games still have to come off. This is tough, people. I think Walking Dead has to make it. Walking Dead has to make it. I think Jedi Survivor, or Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order has to make it. So we're at 20. I have five more games. Ratchet and Clank versus New Super Lucky's Tale. I don't want to make that decision. I think I'm going to pull Resident Evil 2 off because of Resident Evil 7. Again, sticking to that logic I've been talking about for a while now. I think... Oh. I think there's a world where Ratchet and Clank and New Super Lucky's Tale both make it here. But I also want to move Far Cry Primal up. So that's 21. I think we're going to have to make the difficult decision to remove Dishonored here. There's just too much other good stuff. I'd like to see Order 1886 up there. Above Dishonored, maybe? Oh, that's stupid, too. Why would I say that? Um, hmm. I think we're going to move Ratchet and Clank up. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, so twenty two. Twenty-three. What if we move Lost Legacy up? That's twenty-four, and then we have one more. As much as I want to put Heavy Rain, it that one seems like less fair than Journey, in my brain, because it was on PS3. Like I know they both were, but like I'm telling myself in my brain for some reason that. Heavy Rain's less deserving. I mean, from a sheer quality perspective, it of course is less deserving, but... Oh, man. I want Nino Kuni 2 on there, and I want Final Fantasy 15 on there. So if that's the case... What are we pulling off? We have to pull one game off of here. We pull Bloodborne off. We pull Kingdom Hearts 3 off. I think...
I'm really struggling between Ratchet and Clank and New Super Lucky's Tale. Like, I, I know I beat Ratchet and Clank three times to get that platinum, but it didn't feel special in any kind of meaningful way. It just felt like more familiar Ratchet and Clank, whereas New Super Lucky's Tale was a fresh, charming, new 3D platformer that I hadn't played before. And actually streamed a little bit of that too. So I think I'm going to pull Ratchet and Clank off. Let's see how we feel about this. Twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five. I I so badly want to put the order eighteen eighty-six on here. Like if I do, it's gonna be that twenty-fifth spot. And so I'm just trying to think of like what else, like what would be that twenty-fifth game? I don't know, folks. I think we might have our twenty-five games. I think we might have our 25 games here. That feels really good. It feels really good. I mean, there, there are some big bummers here. Like I, Dark Souls 3, like deserves to be up here. Resident Evil 2 Remake deserves to be up here. I think Dishonored Remastered deserves to be up there too. But like Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus, like there's so much that 25 isn't enough. Should we, should we just, should we make that list of 30 games? Should we make a list of 30? No. Let's do this though. Dark Souls 3. Resident Evil 2 Remake. I'm gonna pull Heavy Rain down. We'll pull Wolfenstein 2 above Resident Evil 2 Remake. And we'll say until dawn. There's my bottom five. If I was doing a true list of 30, these would be my bottom. That's six, Rusty. That's six, damn it. Okay, I guess Res uh, Ratchet and Clank would go off then. It'd be Dark Souls 3, Wolfenstein 2, Resident Evil 2 Remake, Order 1886, Until Dawn. That'd be my bottom five. But now, ladies and gentlemen, we have to rank all of these games. It's going to be a long freaking video, so I hope you're sticking around. Let's, uh, let's get to it. All right, we're here. We're doing it. We figured out what 25 games we're going to include in the top 25. Now we've got to rank them. This is actually on Figma. I, uh, I like creating graphics and kind of process mapping stuff out on this site. Uh, for work so i thought it may, might be fun to put something together for the the ranking of the top 25 playstation 4 games so that's what we have here all these graphics i pulled down from what we just did going from 50 to 25 and i i don't know i don't foresee this taking too terribly long i feel like the bottom five to ten is going to be relatively easy to place Surprisingly enough, I feel like the top five is going to be pretty easy to place as well. It's going to be that kind of in-between space that might take a little bit more time to figure out. But we'll definitely go from 25 to 1, take some time to review it, analyze it, and then uh, give it the official Relui stamp of approval. And then, again, you already know what this list is, so I'm uh, kind of retroactively going back and, and figuring this out myself. Assuming that I, I'm doing what I, I said I was going to do and record two separate videos after this. What do we think is a good place to start at 25? I'm thinking... I'm thinking Far Cry Primal might be a really good place to start and kind of kick things off here. Not my favorite Far Cry. That'll probably forever and always be Far Cry 3. But like I said earlier, Far Cry Primal, certainly the most unique game in the Far Cry series. They took a risk. 
I don't think it really paid off for them from a sales perspective, but I think the Far Cry Primal fans that are out there, the hardcore ones, you know, you're a real one if you've played Primal. And we just needed some Ubisoft open world representation up in here. I think that's a good place to round out the list though at the bottom. Because I don't, I don't see that surpassing any of these other games. So we'll start there. 24. Again, there's just a couple games that I, I know are going to be towards the bottom of this list. New Super Lucky's Tale, charming, colorful, just a delightful, happy 3D platformer. I think I like that towards the bottom too. Love to see more, more lucky games in the future. Again, kind of A to B level design. Collectibles are kind of similar to the Donkey Kong Country games. But outfitting little Lucky and all of his different little costumes, and unlocking them, collecting a bunch of coins to unlock those. Such a wonderful, wholesome little time. I like that at 24. I'm thinking everybody's golf. Everybody's golf, Nino Kuni 2, Theater Rhythm. Everybody's golf seems like a good seems like a good spot for that game. We'll keep that there for a little bit, see how we like it. As much as I love Nino Kuni 2, and I'd love for it to be higher up on this list. Again, from a storytelling perspective, don't really remember much. I did really enjoy playing this game alongside my brother-in-law, though, because Again, just another one of those examples where he and I were making our way through the game, texting each other. Hey, have you met, have you got to this point yet? Hey, have you done this? But shout out to Nini Kuni 2 for its real-time strategy elements, the kingdom building stuff. It's really good fun. But I don't really remember the soundtrack being too memorable. Again, story, it's kind of just meh. So we're going to put that in at 22 for now. And I think it only makes sense then that Theater Rhythm would closely follow. Years down the line, I might have moved this up. Bit of a recency bias for including it, but I know I'm going to continue to come back to this game for years to come. Like I said earlier, if I can't start a new Final Fantasy game, I can always pop into Theater Rhythm, play a few songs, Grind out some levels for a new set of party characters that I want to experiment with. And I still got to get, get down on that DLC. We've got Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross music, Octopath, Live a Live, more stuff down the road. The World Ends With You, I think. Some music from that game as well, so a lot of good stuff. Theater Rhythm is just the gift that keeps on giving here in the year 2023. All right, now things get a bit more challenging. This is when we upset others, including myself. What's going to make that top 10? What's going to have to settle for that bottom 10? And I think we're going to kick things off just kind of surprising myself. Because the more I continue to think about this, the more I play Final Fantasy 16, the lower this goes on my FF tier list, and I think the lower it continues to drop on my top 25 PS4 game list, I think we're going to put Final Fantasy 15 at 20. I still need to go back and get the Platinum. I don't know if I'll ever go back and play the DLC. But from a story perspective, this just doesn't stand out among the best. And as much as I loved kind of that heavier Monster Hunter type combat, doesn't really hold a candle to 16. And again, from a storytelling perspective, 16 just does it much, much better. Still like 15. Not hating on it too much, but comparatively speaking, 
among other Final Fantasy games and these other games I have over here. I think it's going to settle at 20. We'll see, though. Um, what else? What are we, what are we thinking? Let's, uh, let's do this. What are some games that we know are going to make the top 10? I think Uncharted 4, Spider-Man, Bloodborne, Ghost, The Last of Us Part 2, I just hit Last of Us Part 2, you can't see it. I think those are locks for top 10. What, is there anything else that I feel like we can... I don't think I can lock Kingdom Hearts 3 up there. I, I honestly think it's... It's probably fair to lock Shadow of War. Possibly God of War. Keep hiding these games. So with that being said, with these games over here, what do we think is coming in at 19? Jedi Fallen Order is standing out brightest here. I'll be like that. I think that looks pretty good there. Jedi Fallen Order. Again, another one that I continue to think about, like I said earlier. I like it more than Survivor. I'm actually, I think, going to get rid of my copy of Survivor while I can still get some good trading credit for it. Because it just... I didn't like it as, as much. Kind of similar to Fort Forbidden West from Horizon side of things. It just... That middle chapter in a, I would think, trilogy of games. And I think the first did it better. Just the opinion of one over here, though. We're going to keep Jedi Fallen Order there at 19. Now at 18... Hmm. Resident Evil 7, Wolfenstein New Order, and Lost Legacy are kind of standing out as the best candidates for that position. But, I don't know. Thinking about Lost Legacy, kind of singing its praises earlier, I, I think that deserves to be a bit higher. Not top, not top 10 category. Not quite that high. But I think it's higher than Wolfenstein New Order. So we're going to pull down Wolfenstein New Order at 18. And I don't really think I said this earlier. Maybe I did. This, again, this has been a long video. Never played a Wolfenstein again. Never played a Wolfenstein game prior to this. And was really taken aback by the story, how compelling, how interesting it was, how well told it was. BJ Blazkowicz kind of being this Terminator, Arnold type character that you actually cared about. And you grew to empathize for. And you were rooting for. And then of course you would run into a room and light up Nazis for about 12 hours. But yeah, no, I think I was most taken back by how enjoyable, if not over the top, the story was. Not quite as good as like Lost Legacy, though. And I just don't, I don't think I could, on good conscience, conscious, on good conscience, it's a weird word. I don't think I can put Lost Legacy above Resident Evil 7, for me personally. So we're going to pull that into 17 for now. And then Resident Evil 7 at 16. Love Lost Legacy. Played it three times. Resident Evil 7 I've only played once. But I will never forget it. If I can pull down the picture of me and my boy Scooby. Because Lauren wanted to be nowhere near that type of experience. Scooby was by my side through the entirety of that game. I literally screamed out loud multiple times while playing it. Absolutely terrifying. 
but I couldn't put the controller down because I genuinely wanted to know what the heck was going on in that house. And I wanted to see Ethan Winter's story come to a close. Great follow up with Village. Cannot wait to see what they do with Nine. I think that's a great bottom, bottom of the list so far though. I like it. I'm not feeling like I want to come back to these. This, this, this feels right to me right now. Number 15. Thought it might be cool to have Final Fantasy 15 fittingly being at that 15th spot, but I don't think we can, we can justify that right now. Maybe staying on the, the horror side of things, I think The Walking Dead, the complete series. When Ryan and I, my brother-in-law, did our top 10 games of the decade podcast episode, it was like three hours. That was very difficult. We did two, two separate things, top 10 games of the decade. And then like the, the, the 10 favorite games of like our youth. So it was like more like the first 15 years of our life than the back 15, like what were our top 10 favorite games. The Walking Dead was like top five for me. That was more of like a recency bias because I had just come off the heels of playing the fourth and final season. I, I don't think I can, I don't think this game would can crack the top 10 for me. Today anyways, again, tomorrow, I might have a different opinion. I will just say, like I said earlier, if you've only played the first season, please, please, I know it's heavy stuff. I know it's heavy stuff, but around spooky season, you gotta do it. You gotta power through. You gotta play seasons two through four and see how Clem's story all wraps up. And get back to me. Twitter. YouTube, drop a comment here, whatever. I got to know, what did you think? And if you've never played The Walking Dead, let me invite you to experience at least the first season, one of the best video games. One of the best video games. Clementine, Lee, you'll never forget it. You will never forget it. Especially if you can go in spoiler free. I like The Walking Dead at 15. I like The Walking Dead at 15. Now we're really going to start disappointing people in terms of what's going to continue to make this list and where it's going to, where we're going to lock in these games. At 14, gosh, can I put Kingdom Hearts 3 ahead of Horizon Zero Dawn? know if I can do this. This is really challenging because Kingdom Hearts is my favorite game of all time. As I talked about earlier how I've the more times pass, the more time passes, the fonder I grow for Kingdom Hearts 3. I'll never forget when I got to that title screen, I installed the game on my PlayStation 4. Lauren snapped a photograph. I was literally in tears. Happy tears of course, but like when that opening cutscene queued up, I, I couldn't help but tear up. We waited like half my life to get to get a follow up to Kingdom Hearts 2. A proper, okay, get that recoded 358 division sign over to whatever other nonsense spinoff games out of here. Proper follow up to Kingdom Hearts 2. Took forever, but we got there. I love Zero Dawn. I really and truly do. Big fan of dinosaurs. Have been my entire life. Jurassic Park's one of my favorite films ever. The mechanical dinosaur thing. Aloy. Fantastic protagonist. One of the best. Such a great new IP for PlayStation. Such an interesting direction for Gorilla to go after Killzone. Just two thumbs up. Yes, would recommend. It's so good. Better than Forbidden West, in my opinion. 
but I don't think I don't think I can include it above Kingdom Hearts 3 right now. I also hmm here's where things also get weird. Do we want to I'm leaning more towards putting Witcher 3 as a top 10 game. But if I do that, I think I think I have to keep ukulele off the top 10 and I just don't know if I can physically do that to myself. Hmm. I think Assassin's Creed Origins is not a 12 or 11 spot. I think that's top 10. We'll explain why later. I think Journey is a top 10 spot. I think, oh, moving things around that I shouldn't be. I think ukulele. Can I say that definitively yet? Well, let's do this. This kind of makes my job easy. I don't, Final Fantasy VII Remake is not going ahead of Witcher 3 or ukulele. So I think that just locks it into that 12th spot. Cannot wait for Rebirth. Cannot wait. Still need to play the Intergrade DLC. 7 Remake is a masterpiece. On its own. Without the other two parts. But. For my personal list. I don't think it goes ahead of these two games. For me personally. I so badly want Witcher 3 to be in my top 10. That was such a phenomenal world to explore. Finally understand the hype behind Geralt and the Witcher games in general. A, such a unique soundtrack too. Unlike, unlike Elder Scrolls, The Witcher has a very distinct sound to its music. It's just different. And I need to play the PS5... Uh, the PS5 port remaster of sorts, but I still think this is going to lock in at, at 11. We might come, we might come back to this one. This is the only one that I feel a little bit iffy on. Let's see what we feel about this list so far before we get in the top 10. How many people are already like writing a paragraph of text of why Lost Legacy deserves to be higher than Kingdom Hearts 3 or why Horizon deserves to be higher than Kingdom Hearts 3. Where are you at? Drop me a comment. I know. I know I'm disappointing people. This is really hard. I would encourage everyone to get in the comment section below. What are your top 25 or top 5 or top 10 PlayStation 4 games? This is a very difficult exercise. Very difficult. But I like where we're at. Is this even 10 games? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yep. All right, friends. We're in the end game now. Coming in at 10. I know we just spent a lot of time debating whether or not Witcher 3 or Ukulele was going to make it in. I think Ukulele is going to sit comfortably at that 10th spot. Here's why this game is making it in my top 10. First of all, Ray Louie. I finally, after many, many years, changed my YouTube handle from Ari Lewis 2011, which by the way, I never plan on making YouTube videos. I made that handle so I can comment on Pete Dorse videos when I was 17 years old. I needed to change the name, rebrand a bit. Ray Louie, obviously a play on both the old Ari Lewis 2011 name, but also Banjo-Kazooie, one of my favorite 3D platformers ever. When I went to college, I really only took my DS and my 3DS with me, didn't play a lot of console stuff, missed a lot of the late 360 gen, early Xbox One, PS4, and like I said earlier, when I went into GameStop and I walked out with Nino Kuni 2 and Ukulele, and I went home and played Ukulele on my PS4, I got the Platinum Trophy in like a week. Not only did it kickstart Probably a horrible love of PlayStation trophies. Trophies. 
but it reminded me of what I loved so much about the games that I played when I was a kid. Super Mario 64, Banjo-Kazooie, Yoshi's Story, Spyro, Crash Bandicoot, those platformers, but particularly the 3D platformers, the Banjo-Kazooies of the world. Where you walked into those levels, sprawling environments where you were just left to your own devices to wander around, pick up collectibles, and 100% the game. Ukulele reinvigorated my love of 3D platformers and reminded me that the genre was still alive. For all its faults, for all of its shortcomings, for all the reasons it doesn't live up to the hype of Banjo-Kazooie as being its spiritual successor, I get it, people. Trust me, I already have a retrospective in the works. We're going to talk about it someday. A dedicated review and video for Ukulele. But for now, this is not only one of my favorite PlayStation 4 games, it's one of my favorite games of the decade. It's one of my favorite 3D platformers. So Ukulele is coming in strong at the 10th spot. Number nine. I think I like Assassin's Creed Origins here. Similar to Ukulele, reinvigorated my love for the 3D platforming genre. Assassin's Creed Origins reminded me how much I love open worlds and more than that, that Assassin's Creed was one of my favorite series. That might sound hyperbolic for people. People might be clicking off of this video, unsubscribing Rusty's basic. He's one of those Call of Duty, Fortnite, Assassin's Creed gamers. So what if I am? So what if I am? We like what we like, all right? This is a judgment-free zone. I loved Origins for all the reasons I described earlier. And... Yeah. I don't know what else to say. It's excellent stuff. Compelling narrative. So much fun to explore Egypt. So much fun. And I need to uh, now probably go deep on the Assassin's Creed merchandise collecting. Number eight. I kind of, uh, I kind of feel like this is going to go to God of War, Shadow of War, if I played God of War at launch, and I played it beginning to end like a lot of people did, never had any of the story bits spoiled for me, and had a complete end to end experience. I think this would be top three on my PlayStation 4 list. But like I said earlier, I streamed this for a little bit, didn't play it at launch, took several months off, came back to it, was like, nah, not feeling it right now, came back to it again, played to the end, knew some of the story bits. So I think for that reason, it just, it's, it's not as complete as an experience for me. But for it to still show up in the top 10 is a testament to that game's writing, its direction, its reinventing of a character, the combat system, throwing that Leviathan axe, whipping it back, the relationship between Kratos and Atreus and the development of them over the course of that adventure is so special. And that's why I still think it makes it in my top 10. I think it's an 8. And I think Shadow of War, Middle Earth, closely to follow. Please play the Middle Earth games, both Mordor and Shadow of War. Monolith. Let's show Talion some love. Let's get those, let's get those PS5, Xbox Series remasters on lock. I need to play them again. I need to play them again. And please, for the love, let's bring back the Nemesis system in other games. We gotta do it. Now we are in the cream of the crop. The best of the best. The top six. 
the top six. <sighs> what screams loudest here? What's not making it to the top five? I think probably the last was part two, honestly. If I smiled a bit more, maybe it would have made it in the top five. But I cried, shake my fist, and I was depressed for like 30 hours straight. No, joking aside, last was part two. Again, for all the reasons I described earlier, an incredible game even though it continues to beat you down relentlessly for those 30 hours. And I'm also one of the few that, obviously the the combat itself isn't anything to write home about, nothing necessarily new to reinvent the wheel. But like I've said many times over the course of this video, I love my stealth. I love navigating certain levels and environments and picking people off the enemies one by one whether it's Wolfenstein, Dishonored, as we talked about earlier, or The Last of Us Part Two. Um, so even though those those bigger story moments were tough to to watch and get through, the moment to moment gameplay, for the most part, again, there there are certain moments in The Last of Us Part Two that I like did not even want to hold the controller, but the moment to moment gameplay I, I do enjoy quite a bit in The Last of Us. So. For all those reasons and many, many more, it's going in at six. I think out of these five, I already know what my number one is. I already know what my number two is. I'm pretty sure I already know what my number three is. Spider-Man and Bloodborne. four and five. I've only played Bloodborne once. Got about halfway through my first New Game Plus run. Played the DLC. No, you know what? I never got through the DLC because I, I started it on my New Game Plus run and I got to Lady Maria. She wrecked me. Absolutely destroyed me and it left a bad taste in my mouth and I never went back to either grind out the Platinum or continue my run. But that is not the reason why this is making it number five below Spider-Man. I just think, for me personally, Spider-Man's a better game. But that's not to say that Bloodborne is not a masterpiece, because that is exactly what it is. That is a generation-defining game. That is a Breath of the Wild, Super Mario 64... Chrono Trigger type of game, like a once in a lifetime hit. And then Miyazaki's like, wait a second, hold my beer. I'm going to make Elden Ring. I need to go back to Bloodborne. Hopefully my next playthrough of it is on the PlayStation 5. And we get that 60 frames per second boost. I think Spider-Man's quick to follow then. Whoa, what just happened? Spider-Man number four. I talked quite a bit about that when I was going from 50 to 25, so I'm not going to talk much more about it. Again, play the game three times. I love it. Cannot wait for Spider-Man 2 later this fall. And then there were three. This is tough. This is tough. I can do this quickly. But let me just say for a second before we lock these three games in their respective spots. What a banger console. Like what a special time to be alive. For these 25 games, the 50 games I've shown over the course of this video and any other PlayStation 4 games you've played over the course of your time owning that system. 
such a robust library of games, a library I will continue to explore for years to come. So many genres, so well represented. And I honestly, honestly feel I've just scratched the surface of what the PlayStation 4 has to offer in terms of its game library. From an exclusive standpoint, standpoint again, I feel like I've hit most of the heavy hitters with the exception of a few. But, wow. What a console. What a library of games. Let's get, get down to business, shall we? Uncharted 4. Number 3. One of the best endings to a game ever, in my opinion. Perfect ending to Nathan Drake's story. Should Naughty Dog want to end his chapter there? Though I suspect we will see more Nathan Drake at some point in the future. What's going to go number two? Well, because I can't, on good conscience, put a PS3 game as my number one. Journey's going to go number two. And one thing I'll say about this game that I didn't say at the top when I first spoke to it was that I was on a podcast called Indie Quest, which you should be listening to if you love indie games. And I was on that show with my good friends, Frantic and Blink. And remember we were kind of talking about our interpretations of the game. Blink said something so profound, yet so simple, that spoke to this game in almost the metaphor for life that you can kind of take away from that experience. And it was the idea, as I kind of talked about, you're going through this game with another wandering traveler. And over the course of my stream, if you watch that, I'll put the link in the description below. I encourage you to do so. I called this person my little friend because I never met the person. I never spoke to them. I never saw what they looked like. They were just this little avatar in this video game that I was wandering this world and going on this literal journey with. And I was terrified during those moments when I thought I was going to be permanently separated or they were going to die in the world based on the things that were attacking us, that I was going to lose them. And for me to be able to form a bond with that person, never knowing them, never speaking to them, never seeing them, is a reflection of how wonderful, beautiful a game that that game company created but I think it's more, as Blink said in the podcast episode, a reflection of how much better life is lived when you go through that journey with a partner, with another person. Whether it's a close friend, significant other, a parent, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, whoever. Life is better and best lived with and going through life with another person. And I think that's part of what Journey's about. Bearing the highs and lows, peaks and valleys of life, and going through that journey with another person. Not to get on my soapbox here or anything like that, but I'm just saying. I get all teary out if I start talking about Journey. But one of the most special experiences playing a video game ever. I cannot sing the praises of that game enough. It's so, so special. Play Journey. And last, but certainly not least, Ghost of Tsushima. Sucker Punch's new IP. My 2020 game of the year. My favorite game on the PlayStation 4. Once again, for all the reasons I described earlier, I think arguably the most beautiful video game ever to this point anyways, nearly any moment in that game is worthy of a photo mode moment, snapping a photograph. It's just so pretty. That cinematic score, great story. Involves complex battle system that's fun to master. 
It's just an incredible game. Hat off to you, Sucker Punch, for creating my number one PlayStation 4 game. People, that's a list. I don't want to get into the game of, wait a second, should this be there? Should that be this? Should be this be moved? Let's sit on this for a while. I want to lock this in right now. Again, maybe later tonight I'll think, you know what? No, Horizon Zero Dawn should be above Kingdom Hearts 3. Witcher 3 should be in the top 10 ahead of Ukulele. God of War maybe above Shadow of War, but no. I don't want to get into the game of that. I like this list. We're locking it in. Boom. Wow. What a journey. What a journey this has been. What a fun exercise this was. I would encourage all of you to get in the comment section. If you've not already done so for my previous two videos, let me know what some of your favorite PlayStation 4 games are. If there was anything you didn't see represented, please rip me a new one. Tell me how much I suck. I'm kidding. Please be nice. Please be kind. But honestly, let me know, are there games you didn't see here that you'd recommend I play? Persona 5 Royal, Metal Gear Solid 5, Red Dead Redemption 2, Control, 13 Sentinels, Age's Rim. The list goes on and on and on. Again, I feel like I've just scratched the surface of the PlayStation 4. But I want to thank you so much for sticking around because this was quite the video. Easily over two hours long at this point. Thank you so much for watching. We will be back with a lot more videos in the near future, including a tour of the game room finally maybe some pickups more retrospective reviews quite a lot more thank you again for watching and i'll see you soon